Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all back here. We are still in the book of Genesis and will be for a long time. But the book of Genesis is so foundational to every doctrine throughout the scriptures. It has answered so many questions that we didn't even know to ask and just makes the New Testament make so much sense after we understand the Old Testament. But if you guys would just pray with me. Heavenly Father, uh, you know what it is that we're about to do and look into your word. And you know the condition of our hearts and our minds, places we've been, things we've done, the things that make us unworthy to come here to hear from you, for your spirit to speak to our hearts. And yet your word says that if we confess our sins, that he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So Lord, I confess I'm a sinner. I confess that I've fallen short in many ways. And we all have. And so we're grateful to be here under grace. That you don't wait for us to work ourselves up to being good enough, but you came down and died for us to make us good enough. So Lord, we approach your throne boldly because we find grace there. Help us this morning that your spirit would speak to us through your word. That we might have examples of how to live and how not to live. That as we walk away, we might be in a better understanding of who you are. We might be better equipped to do your will. And that we might be sharpened for the battle. So Lord, we give you this time in our hearts. Pray that you do that which is pleasing to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we come to the first murder, actually, in the, in the Bible, the first sibling rivalry. Um, we have a couple of siblings here, rivaling. That's okay, Carl's behind him. He'll take care of that. Any of you who've had a brother or sister understands the deep difficulty it is to get along with those who you are related to, brother and sister-wise. And it's no different, uh, the chuckles, yes. And it's no different here for the first two boys that we're, we're told about with Adam and Eve, with Cain and Abel. So as, as we look at them, we're going to just take a remembrance of what we did last week. We'll go over it quickly. We looked at the serpent and the consequences of the fall and how God came to the serpent and said, on your belly you will go all the days of your life and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I think we came to an understanding as to what that means. It means that from now on, human beings are going to be a target for Satan because from dust we were made and from dust we will return we also looked at the prophecy that was given in chapter 3, verse 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, and he will bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. It was the uh, Proto-Evangelium, which is uh, the first time that the gospel is actually preached, the promise that someone who would be an offspring of the woman, but not the man, telling us about a virgin birth, that a Messiah would come and bring salvation, that he would crush the head of Satan. Uh, but that which touches the earth on his body would die, which would be his body. And so we're given this wonderful uh, understanding all the way back in the beginning of Genesis and about how Jesus was bruised for our iniquity. We saw the curses that were explained, not necessarily given, but explained by God that the woman now is going to have this pain in childbearing that the thing that God created her uniquely for, which is bearing children and proliferating and being fruitful, that would be contaminated. Her primary ministry of being wife and mother would be contaminated with sin because her desire will now be for her husband. Her desire is to take the wheel, to be the captain, to run the show, to call the shots. It's deadly quiet in here. Your desire will be to be the husband, but 
he will rule over you. And God has created this order, and it was there even before the fall. It's not just a result of the fall. It's this created order that God had because Adam was formed first and then Eve. And Adam was not the one who was deceived. It was Eve who was deceived and fell into transgression. And there's this natural order that God puts in there. So we looked at that. We looked at the curse upon the man. The curse upon the man is upon his field, his work, and what we do that, that will no longer produce fruit as it once did, but it's going to produce thorns and thistles. And by the sweat of your brow, you will eat bread all the days of your miserable life. I, I kind of feel like miserable belongs in there. That work is going to be hard and it's the ground is going to be hard and the earth is now contaminated because of the sin of Adam. And the thing in which God has called him uniquely to do, which is to keep the earth, to run the earth, to manage the earth, to subdue it, is now going to resist him and resist us. So women in their unique ministry and their character, sin has pervaded that, including the family. And with the man whose work is in the field, his field is now contaminated. So if you don't like your job, it's the, 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 the fault of sin. But work is not sin. And work didn't come after the fall, it came long before the fall. So if you take joy in your work, don't feel guilty. Oh no, I like my work too much. That's the way it's supposed to be. And we saw how Jesus purchased back the earth. We saw that the thorns and thistles that infested the ground he wore upon his brow as a crown. We see the sweat drops that come off of Jesus that hit the ground it's the sweat of our brow that we're going to have all the days of our life that Jesus came and purchased back the earth and he has a right to it and he undoes the curse. Amen? Adam called his name Eve. Now, if you remember, he called her woman first because he was on a naming streak. He did all the animals and, and suddenly she popped up. He said, whoa, man. Yeah. That's the, that's the dad joke. But instead of woman, which means out of man, so her identity is not necessarily tied to him in this, he calls her Eve because she's the mother of all living. He changes her name from woman, which who in the world wants to be called that? I know I don't. Yo, woman. You know, it just doesn't, you know, doesn't ring. But Eve is kind of nice. So Eve means that she's the mother of the living. She's going to bring about a Messiah and see, he knows that. He believes that because she's now the mother of the living because the seed will come through her. Now, they thought for sure they were goners because God said that the day that you eat of that fruit of the tree, you're going to die. They thought it was done. They're done. That's it. He's going to crush us like bugs. And yet there's this promise, God's grace, even in Genesis, that you're going to have a child and it has nothing to do with him. It has to do with you because there's enmity between these two poles here. And God's going to bring us somebody. And he changes her name because of what God prophesies to her. The Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. And we see the first sacrifice that has to be made for sin, God makes. And he covers their nakedness, that which was a result of their sin. He covers with skins, which is a whole lot better than fig leaves which don't cover very well, and they, they feel a little like asbestos. If you've ever been fig picking, um, they have little cilia on the, on the leaves, and it's uh, certainly not a choice of clothing. But it's more than that. There's an innocent animal that has to die because they've sinned so that their sins are covered. This is the beginning of the sacrificial system. 2,000 years before Moses existed, God's already setting down a principle. And he does that so when Jesus comes, when John says, Behold, the Lamb of God. We're going to understand what that means, that he's come to be a sacrifice for the world. And we see that he says, Behold, man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, and lest he put out his hand and also take from the tree of life and eat and live forever. And so he casts the man out to work the field, and which is now cursed because of his sin. And the garden is now off limits. And there are cherubim that get put there, to make sure that they don't get back in there. And cherubim is uh, plural. And it's interesting, we see two of them in the temple where there's a sacrifice to be made, where there's the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant that's there. And we see two at the place where Jesus laid in the tomb. We see 
to cherubim as well. It's interesting that God carries these things throughout and speaks to us. It's interesting that they guarded, they had a flashing sword which turns every way to guard the way to the tree of life. It seems like a little overprotective to put two cherubim, one of which we know killed 185,000 Assyrians in one night. He put two of them there, but it wasn't just them who were in the garden, was it? I don't know what would happen if Satan was able to get his hands on the tree of life. But the interesting thing is, I think they guarded the tree of life so that we might someday come to understand what it was. This is the tree of life. I don't know where life is found in any other name other than in Jesus. Amen. He's the tree of life. And I think the angels guarded the tree of life until such a time as we could eat and drink. And Jesus says, come and eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. My flesh is food indeed. My blood is, is drink indeed. And you will have life. And so we're invited to come and take of the fruit, which is our life in Jesus Christ. So we went over that last week. This week, we're going to look at Cain and Abel and how they grew up. And these are the, this is the first family, if you will. And we're going to see some things that maybe you wouldn't have seen. These brothers are born. And of course, that's probably exciting for Adam and Eve. Having a baby is always wonderful, right? We're expecting. No, you're not. She is. She's pregnant. Maybe you're both expecting, but she's pregnant. And everybody's excited, and there's a new life that's brought in, and then there's, you know, what are you going to name it, and what's the sex of the child, and are you going to have a reveal party, and are you going to do crazy things? Of course you are, because you're having a baby. There are two paths that these two boys choose, and we're going to see what they are. There's murder that occurs because of jealousy. We're going to talk about the root of that, and the confrontation when God comes down and confronts, and we'll see how he handles that, and we probably will learn some things about how we confront things. In verse 1 of chapter 4, now Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. And there she bore again, and a time for his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So we, we hear this wonderful story about how this starts very simple and of course, Eve has to crank them out first, which we understand there's pain because of sin. And so even in the birth process, there's a reminder of sin. But she's going to give birth, essentially, to do good Jewish boys. They're not really Jewish yet because Abraham hasn't come. But we're their predecessors. So <laughs> the two boys. And we're not sure exactly. Uh, some people, uh, some of the rabbis actually believe that they were twins. But uh, the, the scripture says, and then, so I'm not sure it was that way unless it took some time. So they probably grew up. They may have become teenagers. They may have, you know, thrown rocks at windows. And st no, no, that was me. Um, they may have done things uh, as children and maybe gotten in trouble. Uh, I'm sure they spent a lot of time together. Uh, so you've got, the, you've got the two boys that grow up, and boy, they must be proud. Because what does Eve say? She goes, the, the Lord's given me a man. There's, there's kind of the sense that she may have expected this to be the Savior, the one who would undo the curse, the one who would bring them out of, uh, you know, the shame that they bear because of their mistakes. I, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Like, isn't that awesome? God already fulfilled his promise, and yet she's going to be very disappointed because he becomes a murderer. I don't know if you, ha if you have any idea what that's like to have a child that grows up and becomes something completely other than what you expected or hoped. It can be very bone crushing. So we understand that they both take uh, different things to do. Cain, his name means possession. Uh, if you were young, you'd say, mine! You know, <laughs> I, I, I got a man. I got myself a, a little young man. It's going to be a while before he's full grown. But, and Abel means breath which is rather prophetic because breath is something that's fleeting. And that's actually what his name means. It's a breath or a, or a, a, a mist that's, you know, like James says, is there for a moment, then it's gone. And it's interesting. It's almost like his name is a prophecy of what's to come. And he's just a breath. He's just a passing breath. And so we know that one of them became a keeper of sheep. 
He became a shepherd. And the other one worked in the field and made vegetables. And so they've chosen different professions. Apparently, they're, you know, they're, they're leaving mom and dad empty nesters. Uh, they've had other children, but these are the ones that are being highlighted here. And in the process of the time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. And if you guys know the story, and if you know the end of the story, I don't want to spoil it. But he does the best he can at what he does, and he takes the first fruits. It's interesting. They're the first ones. And there's 2,000 years later, there's law, and actually there's a feast of first fruits, where you bring that which God produced, and it's kind of a, a thank you to God for all of these wonderful things, and a hope that he's going to bring more. The rains will keep up, the weather will be good, you know, won't have a week of 100 degree weather, or three weeks of 100 degree weather, it kills your grass. And so, there is something in the Old Testament actually provided for with all of this. Now, it's a bit more involved than just bringing fruit and putting it on a fire. It's a bit more uh, involved, as you can see. I put it in small print. So you can check that out, Leviticus chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. And so he brings the best of what he has. And who wouldn't, in what they do, bring the best of what they have and give it to the Lord? That's uh, certainly what we do, right? Just pretend you do. Just nod your head. That's... We should. Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock and their fat. Now, you might not think fat's a good thing. Fat's a very good thing, actually. You guys are a tough crowd. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. Now, there are three theories that if, if you scour all the books that are out there, there are three bottom line theories as to what this is about. Number one, it was a type of sacrifice that Cain used. Some people believe that it was a wrong sacrifice that he used. In Hebrews 9.22, we're called, and according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without shedding of blood, there's no remission. So if this is a sin offering, the vegetables and the fruits that he brings are not going to have an effect, and it's not what God has desired. You might say, well, how does he know? Because the law doesn't get written for 2,000 years. God left an example with Adam and Eve, didn't he? They were innocent animals that had to die to cover their sin. So if this is a sin offering, that's, that's a good point. Leviticus 17.11 says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for your soul. God has set up the whole sacrificial system so that you wouldn't have to die for your sins, but you could make a sacrifice, an innocent from your flock, one that was without blemish. It had to be a male, by the way, for this. All planned by God way in advance so when Jesus would come, we'd recognize him. So, some people say it's the type of sacrifice. It seems to indicate the sacrifice was wrong, but there's no indication that this type of sacrifice was being offered. There's nothing saying that this was a sin offering. Could have been a first fruits. And that's what's argued in some of the books. Number two, it may have been the quality of the sacrifice. If you read through Leviticus chapter 2, 1 to 12, it's very involved and there's cakes you got to make and there's oil and there's frankincense. And it's a whole thing. And maybe he just kind of threw it together and, and gave it to the Lord. You know, it's kind of like, Oh, it's offering. Oh, they're passing a plate. What do I got? Oh, I got $5 left over for my pork roll and cheese. Here you go. <laughs> it it might have been that he just did it uh, sporadically and it wasn't done from his heart. It may not have been that. And so there, the quality of the sacrifice may not have been there. And then there's a third one, which it was his attitude. If it was a poorly uh, offered execution on his part, you know, where the, you know, the $5 left over from my pork roll and cheese this morning, because, oh, I totally forgot my checkbook, uh, whatever it is, that God did not smile down on his offering and it wasn't accepted. So there are those who say that as well. The third one is that it was Cain's attitude, that he had a bad attitude. Yeah, you, you guys know what that's like? Oh, man, it's Sunday. I got to go to church. And you drag your butt in here and somebody says, hey, good morning. And you go, yeah, hi, 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 how are you? 
the town. How long is it going to be? Is he going to drone on and on about this Cain and Abel thing? I can't believe it. You know what it is to not have a good attitude, right? Everybody's singing, and you're like, blah, 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 blah. yeah, it could have been Cain's heart because God heart, right? And so in Hebrews 11, 4, it says, by faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous and God testifying of his gifts. And though he is being, it, through it, he being dead still speaks. Sorry. I've read this a million times, but when I'm up here, suddenly it freezes in my brain. It still speaks. He had a better one. Why? Because it says by faith, Abel offered. So it very well could have been that he had a bad attitude. Maybe he didn't do it in faith. Maybe he did it begrudgingly. Maybe it was a competition. Maybe his brother bought a specially big lamb and he's like, oh yeah, watch what I got. You know, he brings a wheelbarrow full of vegetables and it may have been a competition or he may have messed it up. It seems to indicate a heart problem that disqualified him from his offering. So you can, you can vote for whichever one you want because I'm not going to tell you. I know, that's what you're paying me for. Well, listen, when we come before God, what makes you approved? What makes you approved? I'm approved of God. Man, I work hard. I wake up early. I go to bed late. I got here before all y'all. That's why God accepts me, because I'm a good boy. And I'm undoing all the evil that I've done in the past, right? Please don't agree with me. It is the sacrifice by which I have approval. It is by nothing that I bring, especially from a cursed ground. <laughs> hey, God, here, you curse this ground. Here, I'm going to give this to you. Well, by logic, it would say that the offering is cursed, isn't it? I am only accepted before God because of a sacrifice that was made on my behalf. And the sacrifice was right. It was Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who died for my sins. Amen? That's why I believe it was number one. So I'm just kidding. I'll let you know. I believe it was a sacrifice. The sacrifice is what makes us able to approach God, not the fruit of our efforts or the production of our works. And yet every other religion on the face of the planet, including some that call themselves Christian, believe that it's all up to you, that you've got to do all these things. You've got to do this and do that. It's a bunch of do, do, do. It's do, do. Because you're not accepted before God on the basis of your good works, because if your heart's not right and you don't have a sacrifice taking care of your sin, everything you do is worthless. Amen? Amen. Ephesians 2, 8 to 10 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. You see, he created us for good works. We don't do good works to be approved. We're approved, so we do good works. Make sense? Which, are, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You know how he prepared beforehand? He sent his son. He sent his son so that any sort of a thing that you might offer to God will be acceptable because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Amen? And aren't you glad for that? We see a picture of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ right here in chapter 4 of Genesis, just like we saw it in chapter 3 of Genesis. It says in Isaiah 64, 6, but we all like an unclean thing and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. We all fade like a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. That's what the scripture describes us as in our natural state. We're all born that way. Uh, from, from young to old, we're all sinners. And we don't have anything to offer until that sacrifice is made and we accept it on our behalf. Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock and his fat, and the Lord respected Abel and his offering. Here's my question. How'd they know? One's bringing an offering, one's bringing one. How do you know if your offering's accepted today? You, you popped it in a box and it didn't fly out? How do you know that your worship is accepted before God this morning, that your worship, that your singing or your joyful noise, whichever you choose to make, that that was acceptable before God? How do you know? 
It is by faith. Because you don't know. I might come early, leave late, and do all sorts of things, but it might be absolute stinko for, for before God. So how did they know that their offerings were accepted? Here's one. Here's the other. You know, one, one looked nice and the other one didn't. Or, you know, was it an inward witness of the Spirit? It was a voice from God? I'd like to submit a little bit of understanding. There were offerings throughout the scripture that were accepted by fire where God shows up and consumes the sacrifice personally. Every one of these, there's six of them here and his would make seven, which is a nice number. Moses and Aaron, they make a sacrifice unto the Lord and the Lord consumes the sacrifice with fire. They don't set it on fire. God comes and sets it on fire. Gideon. Samson's parents, if you remember when they were praying, suddenly the flames went up and an angel appeared and that was God's doing. Elijah, you guys remember Elijah, right? Any of you had Sunday school remember Elijah? And he had a bit of a handicap because they doused it with water. And God came and consumed the sacrifice with fire. And so how did they know it was approved? Might have been the same way that David knew or Solomon knew when they opened up the temple and God set ablaze the fire and suddenly God showed up. And the temple filled with smoke to the point where everybody had to leave. They had to evacuate because God showed up and he showed his approval by showing up and burning up the sacrifice himself. Isn't that interesting? So I think perhaps like this picture shows, it may be that God saw and ignited the sacrifice. And, you know, there's Abel, you know, there's Cain. Man, he gets a fire. I get no fire. So apparently they knew that God approved of one and didn't approve of the other. And I think that may have been it. It says in Hebrews 11:4, by faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts. So we have it in the New Testament that God testified of his gifts. That though, but through it, he being dead still speaks. So God testified of his, I wonder, does God, does God accept your offering? And how will you know? How will you know? I can tell you why God accepts your offering. Because he rose Jesus Christ from the dead Amen. to prove that the offering was acceptable. It has nothing to do about what you do. It has to do with receiving a free gift. That is the assurance that you have eternal life. That's the assurance that it means something to God is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 11, 6 says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So we believe in the life, crucifixion, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's how we know that whatever it is that we do is approved because our sacrifice was. Amen? Yeah. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. In other words, he was really ticked off, and it messed up his face. That's the jersey right there. He was really ticked off, and it messed up his face. You, you know what it is, right? You, you, I know none of you people do that. I do that. And so he's wondering what in the world's going on. God approves of his, but not me. Do you know what it is to be unapproved, not good enough? Isn't that a miserable feeling? No matter what I do, I can't do good enough. Maybe you had an overbearing father or overbearing mother. Maybe you had somebody in your life that you could never please, somebody maybe you looked up to, and they always degraded you and looked down on you, and no matter what you did, it wasn't enough. I hope I'm triggering some of you. <laughs> because you need to understand where Cain is at. It's like... I. I did all this stuff, but it's not good enough. God doesn't receive it. But look, this guy, you know, one lamb and he's done. <laughs> doesn't seem fair. God approves of him, but not me. Why did God give him a Ferrari? I'd like a Ferrari. Isaiah 59, 2 says, but your iniquities have separated you from your God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. 
Whenever you hear the scripture say that God doesn't hear, it's not that he audibly didn't pick up the sounds of the reverberation of your voice. It means that he was not moved to action because whenever God hears, he acts every single time. And it's because of our sin. It's because of our disobedience. You see, I believe Cain knew the right way, but he didn't do the right thing. And he said, well, what I do should be good enough for God. I mean, look at all the good stuff that I have. Your good stuff isn't going to make it. And that's our message to the world, isn't it? That your good works are not good enough to get you before an audience of God. But your iniquities have separated you from God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Ephesians 4, 26 to 27 says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. I recently was made aware of how most people read this passage is that you can be angry, just don't sin, and make sure that you get rid of it before the end of the day. And that's typically the way that it's read. I heard another very esteemed teacher teach that no, not letting the sun go down on your wrath means that you hold on to your anger, that you keep your anger. And not only that, he defined the anger as being angry at sin, which is nowhere in the text, but what else are you going to be angry at? Usually other people. And then I began to study it a little bit further, and it kind of made me mad. <laughs> and I started to get angry. Now, maybe I should stay that way. No. I believe the scripture says that you should not hold on to your anger. You shouldn't let the sun go down in your wrath. Don't let the sun go down and still be angry. Because you know what happens to anger? It festers. It turns into bitterness. It's like holding on to leftovers in your fridge for a month. Don't hold on to it. Get rid of it. Why I say that is because the rest of the scripture then would be completely unnecessary. James chapter 1 verses 19 and 20 says, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. It doesn't prohibit wrath, but you should be slow. If you're somebody who is fast to be angry, wrath. It, this word for wrath is, is theos, which we use for thermometer and things like that. It's heat, quickly generated heat. Some of you may know the psychological term being triggered. That's what it is. I was triggered. It's not my fault I killed you. Be slow to wrath, which means it's implied that you have control, isn't it? Be slow. <laughs> How am I going to control that? I can't do that. No, you can. Be slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Your anger is no good for you to hold on to. Your anger will destroy you physically, socially, spiritually, in all aspects. It will ruin you if you hold on to your anger. You got people who hurt you? How many of you have people who hurt you? Oh, you still remember that, do you? Okay. Let it go. Anger is not something that we can hold on to. It's like somebody throwing a hot coal. You better get rid of it. You better do something with it. You better put it where it needs to be or it will burn you up. Amen? Amen. We have agreement? Good, because I got another passage. Ephesians 4.31 says, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. We are told to put away anger, not to hold on to anger, not to keep it, get away. Well, what if I'm angry at my sin, pastor? You're angry about your sin? My question is, is God angry about your sin? Oh, yeah, until you confess it. Because if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Do you think God's mad about it anymore? Well, why are you? Well, I, I guess I just need to forgive myself, Pastor. No, you are not qualified to forgive yourself. You don't have the credentials to forgive yourself. It's self-interest, isn't it? I would like to tithe to myself. That's what I'll do. <laughs> You're not qualified to receive a tithe from you. You see, you don't forgive yourself. You accept the forgiveness of God. And when you accept the forgiveness of God, the slate's clean. He said so. 
If you say otherwise, then guess who's wrong? I can't forgive myself. There's, there are things I've done that were horrible and I knew better. I can't forgive myself. And I'm not qualified to forgive myself. I'm not eligible to forgive myself. That's self-interest. Put it away. That's what you're supposed to do with your anger. You work it through, you deal with it, you fix it. You don't carry it. Colossians 3.8, but now you yourselves are to put off all these. First one, anger. anger. Put off anger. Put it off. Ma wrath, which is that <sighs> malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. So here's a list of things if you want to get rid of some things. Here's, the, here's what the scripture tells us to do. Get rid of them. You don't hang on to it. You can't handle your anger. See, that's the problem. You can't handle your anger. And you know what else you can't handle? Carrying your own sins. You can't carry your own sins, can you? Can you pay for your own sins? Oh, people try. I'm going to be good, God. I've, I'm not going to eat anything all day after that muffin. You know, <laughs> people try to pay for their sins instead of just saying, you know what, I blew it, Lord. Please forgive me and help me so that I don't ever do it again and help me repent. And then you go into it with a clean slate and the right attitude and the right relationship so you can actually do the right thing. Does that make any sense? It makes too much sense. So, we can't handle the anger. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Isn't that funny? You know, he's over there, I can't believe it. Hey, why are you angry? Do you think God knows? He absolutely knows. It's like, Adam, where are you? Who told you you were naked? Did you eat from the tree that I told you not to eat from? He finds Eve and he goes, what is this that you have done? Question, 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 question. God comes asking questions. He doesn't come with lightning bolts to cut your head off. I wonder how you address people who have sinned against you. Hey, uh, did you realize that you just stole my wallet? <laughs> did, did you realize? Did you know that? That, it, that would be a much smaller thing, wasn't it? Wouldn't it? And it's so ridiculous to think about. And he says, why are you angry? And why is your countenance fallen? Why is your face all messed up? If you do well, will you not be accepted? It's another question. If you do the right thing, won't your face get better? You get, get all those wrinkles out of your face and, you know. And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door and its desire is for you. But you should rule over it. It's interesting. It sounds just like the curses upon the woman and the man. Your desire will be for your husband, but he will rule over you. Notice the echo. He's not accepted. Any of you have a sense that you're not accepted? None of you. Wow, that's great. This is an awesome church. I've walked into churches, I've walked into churches and not had a person greet me. Uh, yeah, really. I, uh, not this church, of course, but <laughs> can, can hardly, when it's time to go, I have to give my wife a 30 minute warning. Hey, we should go in 30 minutes because that's what it'll take to say goodbye. <laughs> you, you know, there's always one out of every couple that takes forever to say goodbye. And then there's the other one who's outside with the car running, you know, on their phone. So you think I don't see these things. <laughs> Cain did not have acceptance from God. Acceptance is a universal human need to be esteemed, validated, regarded, respected, and seen and approved. It is a basic human need. And what happens when we don't get it from God is we seek it from people, things, drugs. <laughs> we, we seek it from social settings. We seek it from all sorts of things. Commonality. Hey, I'm going to get in a in a car club, or I'm going to get in a stamp collecting club, or I'm going to get, and we seek for that approval with people that are like-minded. 
If you don't have approval from God, I'm telling you, none of that will help. It's just distraction. It's like a Band-Aid on an artery that's bleeding. Acceptance is what we have from God, and then we don't need the acceptance of anyone else. Did you notice that? When you're right with God, somebody can say the worst possible stuff in your face, and you're like, wow, why are you angry? You know, if you do the right thing, your face will get better. We need acceptance by God. We need acceptance from others. And by golly, you need to accept yourself. What, pastor? I thought you just said I can't forgive myself. No, you can't. But you can accept forgiveness and therefore be good and have your slate clean. I'm, I just need to love myself. You love yourself fine enough, man. You don't need to worry about that. What you need to do is accept God's, you need to have God's acceptance, which means that we need to do the right thing. We don't like to hear that because it involves me doing something which is submitting to him. Ephesians chapter one, verses six and seven says, to the praise of his glorious grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Amen? Amen. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. It's not to the amount of your grace because you might not have a lot of grace. The pool of grace might be very shallow for you. And yet it's according to God's grace, not yours. I'm glad for that. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? I love that. And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is to have you, but you should rule over it. I don't know if you've ever been stalked by something. I ran into a skunk last night. I was... You know, beautiful night, nice and cool, rolling up the driveway, and I just got hit with the smell. And there was this dark shadow wandering beneath the car in front of me. And I said, oh, here we go. I can tell you, I sped up because I didn't want a confrontation. He's talking about Sin's desire is crouching and hunting for you. We don't normally see temptation like that. We see temptation kind of in our face, and it's like, hmm, that's interesting. Maybe I could do that, but I really shouldn't. But by golly, that muffin looks so good. We don't think that sin is crouching at the door and it wants to devour us. We don't think of it that way. And yet, that's the proper way to think about it, isn't it? It's going to be a whole lot better to say no to the kitty if I know that it wants to devour me and it doesn't look like a beautiful blueberry muffin that's been grilled within an inch of its life and covered with butter. I had to find another emblem other than cheesecake. Hey, I wouldn't open that door if I were you. You know, it's a good idea to accept counsel from people because there are things that people consider undoing and there are people who have already done them and have discovered I never should have done that. There's a place for counsel. There's a place to find people who are down the road a little further than you and say, hey, I'm thinking about investing in this thing. What do you think? It's a good idea to seek some counsel because somebody who's been beat up will be able to tell you about it. Sin lies at the door and its desires to have you, but you should rule over it. I have news for you. Your sin doesn't rule you. Your temptation doesn't rule you. You are not if you were in Christ Jesus, there's no such thing as an addiction in your life, at least validly so, unless you give it permission. Because you don't do it with your eyes closed. You do it with all the power to say no, because Christ died for you. And you know why I know that? Because the Bible says it. In 1 Peter 5, verses 6 to 9 says, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Sometimes there's timing involved there. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober and vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith. The scripture would not say that if we did not have the ability to do it. But being in Christ Jesus, we do. Without Christ Jesus, you're an addict to whatever it is you submit yourself to. 
It could be overworking. It could be um, oversaving. It could be over controlling. It could be over imbibing. And you wake up the next morning and it's never any better. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you except that which is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but along with the temptation will provide a way of escape so that you can stand up under it. You believe that? There is nothing, oh, pastor, you would not believe what I'm going through. No, I would. I'd probably heard it before. Oh, no. There's this woman at my job, and she's hitting on me hard. Oh, really? No, I've never heard of that. Yeah, you're right. There's nothing new under the sun. There's no temptation that is not common. Everybody's going through it. In fact, Jesus was tempted in every way as we are, and yet without sin. But I know God will provide a way out. You know, he's provided a way out. You know what his name is? Jesus. Jesus is the way out because he's the one who crushed the serpent and that which touched the ground, which was his heel that died, that's his body. And Romans 6, 13 and 14 says, do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness. He's talking about our bodies, the parts of our bodies to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God for sin shall not have dominion over you for you are not under the law, but under grace. Sin doesn't rule you boys and girls. Amen. Jesus came so that you could say no and mean it and have the power of God behind it so that it doesn't happen. Isn't that awesome? In Philippians 4, 11 to 13 and verse 19 says, Paul, uh, speaking about how they were being generous toward him, he says, not that I speak in regard to need. He wasn't looking for a handout. For I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Have any of you ever learned, any of you learned to be content in whatever state you're in, whether it's New Jersey or... I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. You know, it's, sometimes it's easier to have nothing than it is to have everything. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Everybody knows that verse, right? But it's talking about being content in whatever situation or whatever state it is that you're in, including New Jersey. (laughs) Verse 19 says, and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. He will supply everything you need to handle the time when you don't have enough food in the fridge, when you don't know how you're going to pay that bill, when you get bad news from the doctor. He will be the one who gives you the strength to be handling whatever it is that life throws at you. Amen? Amen. Glory to God for that. Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass that when they were in the field, Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. I don't know if any of you have had a physical fight with somebody. I realize that not everyone has. But anything can happen. Somebody pull out a knife. I've had it happen. And you just think, oh, this is it. (laughs) I can only imagine what that was like to have your brother kill you. I can only imagine how Adam and Eve had handled that. And, and the other people that were in their family, because they were all family at that point. You know, get, getting carried away with your emotions and busting loose because somebody else has better than you, they're accepted by God and not you, or they've got a better deal, you think, from God than you, it's a very common thing to be jealous. It's a very common thing to be envious. I think every single commercial is designed to generate envy. And yet it was acted upon. The first John 3, 11 to 13 says, for this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? It's a good question. 
because his works were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. Don't be surprised if the world looks a lot like Cain. I'll be at the mall today from three to five with my face in front of the public, with scriptural texts all over a table. I am not going to be surprised if somebody hates me and they don't even know me. And I don't care. Because I'm called to show the love of Jesus Christ to people and maybe that will be enough for them to realize they shouldn't stay the way they are. I'll say, hey, why are you angry? What do you mean? Your face, it's all messed up. What do you mean? Oh, it's just the Bible verse today. Really? Yeah, let me show you. So Cain kills Abel, the one who is Cain. His mom had lots of hopes in him. He ends up becoming a murderer, probably breaking his mom's heart. And the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? God with the questions, not accusations, not a sledgehammer, not a bolt of lightning. I, I just think God's like that, don't you? That's the way my father was. He hears a story of something I did. He turned red instantly and went looking for me. God shows up. He just killed his brother. God shows up with a question. Do you hear the gentleness in his voice? This is the grace of God. Where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. You know what we call that? A lie. <laughs> Am I my brother's keeper? Do you know what the answer to that is? Yes. yes. We're learning all kinds of things. And he said, what have you done? You see, God is inviting a confession, just like he did with Adam and Eve, just like he does with you. The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. That's interesting. Didn't know that blood had a voice. First of all, God confronts Cain directly and lovingly. You want to know how to settle or resolve an issue that you have with somebody? Don't tell a million people. Don't put it on Facebook. Don't gossip your brains out. Go talk to them directly lovingly. Make sure you have a right heart. Because if you don't, you'll mess it up. Don't bring an ax with you. God, again, asks a question that he already knows an answer to. Do, do you think it's deceitful to ask a question that you already know the answer to? I've had, I've had people come up to me and explain everything that's going on in a certain scenario. And then I'll see a person that's part of that scenario. And they say, hey, Pastor Dave, how you doing? I'll say, hey, what's going on? And I act like I know nothing. You know why? Because that's what God does. And you get to find out what's in the heart of people. Sometimes you get a different perspective. It's best to be quiet and listen very often. Cain lies. He has no remorse and he takes no personal responsibility for his actions. Do you see that? No personal responsibility for his actions. He lies flat out. I don't know where he is. I know where he is because his blood's crying out from the ground. I'm God, by the way. Remember? I know everything. <laughs> he says, why? What, am I supposed to take care of my brother? His little brother? Yes. Perhaps he believes that God and Abel received what they deserved. Because he was mad at God because he didn't get his approval and because Abe seemed to be fable, uh, favored, he got what he deserved. I could see that happening from my heart. And 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, for godly sorrow produces repentance. That's the kind of sorrow you want. Leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. We should grieve over our sin. We should mourn over our sin. We should repent of our sin. That's a godly sorrow. You shouldn't get depressed, 
take a bunch of drugs, curl up in a fetal position for three weeks, just cash it in because you have a, a mighty God who loves you. And that's just a bunch of avoidance. Romans 8, 1 to 2 says, There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. You know what the law of sin is? If you're a sinner and you submit to it, you submit to urges, you're a slave to it. And the next time it won't just be a little, it'll be more. And every... All sin leads to death. Ultimately, that's the plan. Your blood cries out from the ground. I wonder what God hears from America. I think the innocent blood of millions of babies cries out from the ground and asks for justice. Romans 12, 17 to 21 says, Repay no one evil for evil, have regard for good things in the sight of all men. And if it is possible, as much as it depends upon you, live peaceably with all men. And beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place for wrath, not yours, God's. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Heaping coals of fire on somebody's head is not making them miserable by you being nice to them. It's actually giving them something which they can go home and reignite their furnace. That's what it means. And that's the end. We'll pick it up next week. So if the worship team can come up. You know, Cain and Abel, even as antique as the story is, is still very telling of today's way of life. There are two paths to be chosen. One is that I accept a sacrifice on behalf of my sin. The other is I'm going to try to do it on my own, but I'll never be happy. I'll never be approved before God. I'll never have true fulfillment in my life because Christ isn't the center. If you haven't found Jesus Christ to be faithful in your life, if he hasn't filled that empty, cavernous, giant pit of need inside your soul, he wants to. And he can, so that you don't have to be a slave to your own evil desires.